Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Tolfrey and I'm a clinical psychologist and my pronouns are she, her. I'm here today to talk to you about loss, specifically loss within a pregnancy um, or beyond. I'm also here as someone with lived experience of baby loss, so I've had an early loss as an ectopic pregnancy um, and I've also had the experience of stillbirth. Um, my daughter was stillborn at 37 weeks. So today I'm kind of holding two hats and thinking about loss from those two different perspectives as a professional and someone who's been there too. Just a note on language today, because I know that this is quite a complicated and very, very sensitive subject to cover. So I'll use the terms pregnancy loss or baby loss kind of interchangeably. Uh, some of those will resonate for you, some may not. Um, there are no rights and wrongs in terms of the language around loss. So it's really important that you use the right thing for you. And of course, I know that you didn't lose your baby, you didn't misplace them. This is something much more tragic than that, that a baby has died. Um, but sometimes loss can be a bit more of a universal term that people feel comfortable with. Today, I'll be using the terms mother and birthing person interchangeably as well. I'll also be referring to partners because we know that baby loss can affect anyone. There may be lots of different reasons that have brought you to this session today. Maybe you're someone who's already lost a baby or you're in this position where you're waiting to see whether you are about to lose a baby or making a really difficult decision about potentially terminating a pregnancy. If this is your situation, I am truly, truly sorry. Maybe you're watching this because you're interested in knowing a bit more about baby loss or maybe you're thinking about how to best support someone you know who's going through it. Everyone is welcome in this session. I hope there'll be something for all of you to take away, but I'm also aware that it is very sensitive. I would really encourage you to take this session at your own pace, take breaks if you need to. It's really important you practice self-care when thinking about a subject matter as sensitive as loss. Today I'll be covering the whole spectrum of loss through from early pregnancy loss to term losses and death post birth. I'll also be thinking about people who have maybe had struggles on their fertility journey, so losses on that path to parenthood. And also for people who are childless, not by choice. I hope that there is something for everyone who's watching today. In this section, I will be talking about the early days and weeks after you experience your loss or find out about difficulties on your path to parenthood. For some people, you may be in a situation where people don't know what's going on for you and you have this difficult choice of telling them whether you were pregnant and then have lost your baby. Um, equally, you may be much later on in a pregnancy and have very little choice about whether you tell people or not. And that's really, really tough. What I would encourage you to do is think about how does it feel comfortable for you to communicate your news? It might be that using text message, it feels the safest thing for you to do. Um, but likewise, it might be finding a trusted person that you can ask to share your news with your other friends and networks. It's really important that you think about what's comfortable for you to share in these early days. This is your news and you should take it at your own pace and set your own boundaries. Some people feel very unsure about what they want to share with people and I encourage you to just to think about what feels right for you. Whether you share or whether you don't has no bearing on how much you care about or wanted or loved your baby. Right now, it really is about protecting your own heart and your own well-being. Something that's really important to think about is your physical recovery in these early days and weeks. No matter how or when you lost your baby, it's likely that you're going to need a period of time to recover physically. Whether you've had surgery or maybe you've given birth, your body will be in potentially a state of shock. So you really need to think about how you're going to nurture and look after your body and treat it with compassion. You deserve to look after yourself as much as someone who brings their baby home with them. Think about feeding your body, watering your body, making sure that you're getting all the nutrients that you need for your recovery. And also make sure that you're getting the physical checks that you deserve to have as well. So going to your GP, maybe speaking to the midwife or going back to the early pregnancy unit if you are having any difficulties whatsoever. 
remember that lots of the symptoms that come with a physical recovery after a baby loss can be really triggering and traumatic. So for example, bleeding can be something that really reminds you of your loss when it happened. These are things that are gonna take a lot of time, lots of sensitivity and lots of compassion to work through. But you deserve to look after your body. It's not uncommon for people to have really complicated relationship with their body post loss. Lots of people feel that they've lost trust in their body. They may have a lot of anger towards their body. And it can feel really cruel when you look down and see things like stretch marks um, or a very empty stomach where a baby once was. This can be another huge trigger that you're trying to navigate. So if you find that you've got a really complicated relationship with your body, how you feel and looking at yourself, that's really normal. And lots of people feel like this too. This can take some time to recover from. Remember to seek help for any worrying symptoms. You can ask to have medication to suppress lactation if that's something that you want to consider. And if you have any concerns whatsoever, please do go and get it checked out. You have done nothing wrong. Your body is responding in the way that it is because you've been through something traumatic. So please make sure that you are looking after yourself physically. Lots of people describe a physical ache in their arms when they go home after a baby dies. Likewise, some people also experience something like phantom kicking, so they might feel their baby moving even though they know that their baby is no longer with them. Again, these are really normal things that lots of people experience. Um, it is sadly a really, really difficult part of the grieving process. The emotional recovery after a loss can be a very long and complicated one. There are no right or wrong feelings to have, but it can be really scary at times, particularly if you've never been through something traumatic like this before. You might find yourself feeling emotions that you've never experienced before, that don't really sit with your sense of who you are um, or the person that you want to be. But whatever you're feeling is completely normal and understandable given what you've been through. The problem that we tend to have in society is that we're not very good at talking about death and grief. And this is something that particularly in the UK, we are just not very well versed at talking about. So historically, death was very much spoken about in Victorian times, but after the world wars, death was very much silenced and grief was silenced to try and keep people on the war effort. And that completely changed how we grieve in society. And also, the death of a child is one of those things that people find absolutely unbearable to think about. People don't have a language for it. There isn't an official term for a bereaved parent. So you're coming into a world where you're dealing with so much distress and people just are not comfortable or have the right words to talk about this with you. And of course, different cultures and different religions will have different ways of responding to and understanding death, grief and the loss of a baby. It's really important to remember that you're not grieving in a vacuum, that everything that you're feeling will be through a lens of your surroundings, your culture, your networks, your communities, and all of these will have an impact on how you're processing things. Some of you may be really familiar with the feelings of grief because sadly you may have lost someone before. So those really confusing, overwhelming feelings may be something that you have had in the past. But of course, this may be a different level of intensity than what you have experienced before. What we know about grief is that it is messy and it is complicated and it is really tough, even though it was something that we will all experience sadly at some point in our lives. Over the years, there's been a lot of research into trying to understand the processes around grief and grieving. It's a really hard thing to research because there are so many different factors that come into play when someone dies. For example, how they die and when they die. When a baby dies, this is completely out of the natural order. So it is a particularly complicated, particularly emotive grief and loss. Lots of you will be familiar with the stages of grief model. So the idea that there are different stages that we work through when someone dies. The thing with this model is that often people feel like it's promoted, like it's a linear process, that it's really neat and you move through these processes in a way that's seamless 
And at the end, you come to a point of acceptance and everything's fine. And of course, we know that grief isn't like that. It is messy and it's chaotic. And we feel like we move backwards and forwards through these stages. And actually that model wasn't ever developed to be a linear stage model. It really is thinking about the different things that we do go through when someone dies. So the different emotions, um, the different processes that happen when we're grieving. There are lots of different models and theories that people have come up with. Some are less relatable maybe to some of you than others. I particularly like the dual process model of grieving by Strobe and Schult. And what they say is that there are these two different types of activities that come with grief and grieving. There are loss oriented activities and there are restoration oriented ones. And that we constantly move between these when we're grieving. So you might find that at times you're feeling lots of pain and despair and other times distracting yourself, getting on with life, engaging with things that may bring moments of joy and relief. And for lots of people, they may feel quite confused if they're in the restoration activities in some of the darkest times of their life. They sometimes may feel guilt or shame that they're laughing or enjoying something. But this actually is a really important part of the grieving process because we can't stay in one or the other all the time. If we remained in the loss oriented activities all the time, we would be quite stuck. We would be stuck in our pain and not being able to move forwards. Likewise, if we were always in restoration oriented activities, we might be ignoring some of the really intense feelings that come with grief and grieving that we kind of have to feel, unfortunately. But this idea that we can move between the two that gives us some respite from the pain, but also allows us to feel the things that we need to feel. This is what they propose is healthy grieving. And certainly it's the things that I would see again and again with people and really reassure them that those two things are really normal. This is a normal part of the grieving process. It's really important to remember that all feelings of grief are valid, that sometimes we think that we can reserve the feelings of grief for when someone has died, but actually we can grieve all sorts of things. So you may be grieving the path to parenthood you thought you were going to have, or the amount of babies you thought you were going to have, or you may be grieving the fact that you may not become a parent. All of those things are really valid. Your grief matters and allowing yourself to go through this process is really important. Another model of grief that I think is really helpful particularly when you're in these early days and wondering, are you always going to feel like this? Are things ever going to get better? Is Tonkin's model of grief and the idea that our life grows around grief rather than our grief shrinking. So I think often we might feel this or society might feel this, that our grief should maybe be big at the beginning and then get smaller and smaller over time. But this model proposes that the size of our grief, imagining it's like a ball, that that ball will remain the same size all the way through our lives. But in the initial weeks and months, our world will be very, very small around that. So the grief will feel all encompassing. But as time goes on, our world grows, grows and grows. So our grief is there, but we may not collide with it as much as we would have done at the beginning. And yet when we do, the feelings can feel like it's just happened. It can still feel very, very painful, but we just don't collide with it as much as we would. So if you do find yourself feeling the same intensity of feelings around your grief, even years and years down the line, that's completely normal. We would only really be concerned if you were having those feelings all of the time and they were impacting on your ability to live your life. But the feelings of grief can stay consistent over time. Your life just grows around it. There's another theory around grief and bereavement, which is called meaning reconstruction. And this really is about not only going through the process of grieving, but having to really make sense again of yourself, your understanding of who you are and where you fit in the world. And in fact, your, maybe your views of the world, because everything changes when you lose a baby. Your sense of safety can change, your sense of hope can change. You may feel things that you've never felt before. So actually alongside the grieving of the baby that you've lost or the life that you've lost, you're also trying to make sense of who you are now and where you fit in the world. That's really tough. There's a lot that's going on in the aftermath of the loss of a baby. There's also a theory around disenfranchised grief, and that focuses on the grief and the losses that happen in society that aren't often recognised. And I really feel that baby loss is one of those things. When a baby dies, particularly earlier in pregnancy, or maybe the losses around your fertility journey, 
um, or being childless not by choice. These are losses that aren't seen by society. People aren't comfortable talking about them. And that can leave the person who's experiencing those feeling very lonely and very isolated. So something very complicated about grieving the loss of a baby or the loss of a hope. And often when I speak to people in my clinics, I'm always normalizing that whatever you feel is entirely normal. There is no kind of right trajectory with grief. Um, it's a very complex, complicated process. So whatever you're feeling, just please be reassured that whatever you're feeling is normal. Something that can be a really important part of the grieving process is memory making and developing some rituals around your grief. And for those of you who maybe have lost a baby later in pregnancy, that can start quite early on. If you've got good bereavement care, you may have had the opportunity to make some memories with your baby. You might have photos or handprints. Uh, you may also be planning a funeral. So these are really significant markers of the grieving process and they're really important for you to feel that you can engage in those. It can be really tricky though if you have lost a baby earlier on and maybe you haven't had that opportunity to be supported in developing memories, developing rituals. And I would really encourage you to think about maybe doing something for yourself. For some people they may plant a tree or a plant, for some people they may buy a piece of jewellery or have a tattoo. There are no rights or wrongs again around this, but finding something that feels comfortable for you that might mark the date of your loss, um, maybe your due date, something that really ena enables you to remember, and that is an important part of the grieving process. There's another theory in grief and grieving called continuing bonds, and that really talks about the importance of maintaining a bond with the person that you've lost throughout your life. And I think that really sort of complements this idea of rituals and memory making. One thing I do see over and again, though, is where people's need to engage in some of those things may change over time. So maybe at the beginning, you need to engage in these things daily because that is helpful for you and it helps you to grieve and process what's happened. But as time goes on, you might feel that they don't work for you anymore um, or actually that they are getting in the way of you moving forward because we never move on, but we may move forward in our lives and grow our lives around our grief. So remember that whatever you do around rituals, around making memories, that you can change these and you can start new ones at any point. Now, often I see people whose losses happened years ago and will think about things that they can start doing now that will help them to remember the baby that they've lost. So if you're feeling any guilt or any shame for not doing the things that you did earlier on in your losses or that you didn't do something maybe at the beginning, it's okay to restart these things and change them over time because our relationships with people who are alive change over time. So if you find that you want to introduce something further down the line or change the way in which you're marking your baby, then that's absolutely fine. It's completely normal. Now, we know that there are some very painful divisions in baby loss, and that will then determine what support you get and maybe what leave you're entitled to from work. So if your baby was born after 24 weeks, then you will be entitled to full maternity leave. But anything before that, even if it's just one day before, you're not entitled to that. So it's really important to think about what do you need to get through these first few weeks and months how much time can you get off work and how much time do you need off work? Can you go to your GP and be signed off? And what other support may be available for you through your workplace, if that's the situation that you're in? I'd really encourage you to think about when and how you return to work. Obviously, I appreciate that there, for some people, isn't a huge amount of choice in this and you may financially need to go to, back to work sooner than you feel comfortable. But if this is the case, I'd really invite you to think about what support is available through work and how you can return safely. So who can be your trusted person at work that you speak to? Can you speak to your line manager and think about a graded return to work? And is there the possibility of support within the workplace, so through HR or occupational health? 
because returning to work after the loss of a baby at whatever stage can be a really, really difficult one. You might be faced with challenging questions from people. You may still be physically recovering and certainly you will absolutely still be emotionally recovering. So really thinking long and hard about what do you need and how to get that is going to be key. Loss that occurs at any point on the path to parenthood has a huge impact on our mental health and well-being. And sadly, it's something that we don't necessarily understand that well, and it hasn't been that well researched up until recently. We know that people who have miscarriages, for example, are at an increased risk of being diagnosed with PTSD. So this is something that's a hugely traumatic thing. On top of it being a grief, this is a trauma that people have lived through as well. So often we'll see this kind of overlap of grief and trauma and potentially other mental health difficulties like anxiety and depression. And it can be a really confusing picture to understand, well, what's normal and when might I need a bit more help? You might find yourself having some very confusing and overwhelming feelings. So potentially a lot of anger, maybe lots of anxiety and fear and of course, sadness and desperation. So all of these feelings are really normal, but they can be really scary, particularly if you've never experienced them before, and certainly not at this intensity. These are all a normal part, again, of grief and processing trauma. And it is that fine line between working out what do you need to sit with and process and work through, and actually what may, may be kind of more indicative of something that's a bit more worrying and where you might need a bit more support um, from a mental health professional, for example. What I would say is it's about keeping an eye on those feelings. Are they getting so intense that they're becoming unbearable, that you're having to do things to try and shut off from those emotions and block them out? Are they going on for an extended period of time at the same intensity? And are they stopping you from doing the things that you need to do day to day? So are they stopping you from looking after yourself, keeping yourself safe, doing the basic things like cleaning yourself, feeding yourself? So it's really important just to keep an eye on it or make sure that someone else is keeping an eye on you because there is support out there. Sometimes it's just about knowing how and where to get that from. The loss of a baby or going through loss in any form throughout the perinatal period is something that can be incredibly traumatic. So I've talked about that overlap between loss and grief and depression, anxiety, and also trauma. And I think often trauma is very misunderstood. We talk about it actually a lot more, I think, in mainstream media. But actually, what does that mean? And the loss of a baby is definitely a traumatic event. You've lost something or someone, a hope, a dream, a person. And what we know about trauma is that it is something that sometimes needs a bit more support, particularly if it develops into something like post-traumatic stress disorder, so PTSD, which is something that we know can occur and does occur in the aftermath of baby loss. When we go through something traumatic, the fight, flight, freeze response part of our brain, so the amygdala, is activated. And that is really important. It's kind of helping to look out for threats and trying to keep us safe. But what it means is that we don't process what's going on. We don't process those memories in the way that we need to. So it can't really shift from there into the long-term memory part of our brain. And what happens is that those memories then can get stuck. They get stuck in this part of our brain and they tend to kind of pop out when we don't want them to. So in therapy, we often talk about the airing cupboard analogy. So traumatic memories are a bit like um, you know, a huge king size duck down duvet and you're trying to shove it into a tiny cupboard um, and you manage to get it in and shut the door. But every so often when you walk past that door pops open and the duvet falls out on top of you and it's really overwhelming. You didn't expect it. You didn't want it. So you try and shove it back in and shut the door again and you feel a bit better. But of course, another time you walk past, that door will pop open, the duvet will come out. And this is how traumatic memories work. They're involuntary, they may come back to us as nightmares, intrusive images, um, and sometimes a bit like, we, we call them flashbacks, so a bit like you're reliving exactly what happened. It's like it's happening again. So what we need to do really with traumatic memories 
is to get the duvet out, flatten it down, fold it up, vacuum pack it and put it back in the cupboard. That's kind of like processing a traumatic memory. So we're not getting rid of it, we're not eradicating that memory, but we're helping to get it to where it needs to be in a safe, contained, neat, processed way. So sometimes we might need therapy in order to do that. It can happen spontaneously, and it does for lots of people. So you might find those intrusive images and memories and nightmares happen a lot in the immediate aftermath. Um, but generally, for lots of people, it will get better over time. But for some of us, it won't. And that's where getting appropriate support from a qualified mental health professional will help with that. Something that often occurs when we've been through something traumatic is that we become very hypervigilant to our environment. So we're constantly looking out for signs of threat, um, signs of potential triggers, and therefore we might find ourselves avoiding situations. So trying not to go to places where we think we might be triggered, um, where we might then have to face reminders of what we've been through. And for some people that may also mean kind of re-experiencing images and memories. Again, this is a really normal response. You are just trying to keep yourself safe. No one wants to feel these things. No one wants to be in situations where they feel triggered. It's going to get problematic potentially if it stops you from doing the things that you need to do or you want to do. So it is a fine balance and I will talk a bit, um, a bit later around how do you look after yourself and set boundaries. But with all of these things, it's really trying to find that balance between what am I doing to keep myself safe and what maybe do I need a bit more support with? Because we can't always avoid and all triggers, we can't always keep ourselves safe. And everything that I've said here also applies to non-birthing partners too, because they are likely to have witnessed some very, very difficult things, felt very out of control themselves. And equally, they have also lost a baby. So it's applicable to anyone who's impacted by the loss of a baby. If you find that you are impacted by any of the things I've spoken about, it's really important that you do seek help. And often the best place to go is to your GP who can give advice of services in your local area. In this section, I'm going to talk about navigating relationships in the aftermath of loss which is a huge topic and a really painful one for lots of people. Sometimes we find that loss can bring people closer together, but likewise, we know that it can have a huge impact on breakdowns in relationships, partners, friendships, family networks. It's not uncommon for two people in a partnership to grieve very differently. We're all different people. We all arrive at this in a very different place with different personalities and life experiences. So often we will deal with this quite differently. And often the non-birthing partner has to go back to work a lot sooner, potentially. So you might find that you are on your own for extended periods of the day, sat with your feelings while your partner is able to distract themselves and feels like maybe they're not necessarily feeling the same things as you. And of course that's not necessarily true, but they may just be coping with things in different ways. Or they don't have a choice because we know that lots of people do have to return to work because we don't always get the financial support we need when we go through a grief like the loss of a baby. The key thing is communication, just making sure that you're talking about this and naming it because we don't have to grieve in the same way, but acknowledging that maybe the different ways in which we grieve will have an impact on the other person is really important to acknowledge. And sometimes getting a safe space, like some counselling together, will be somewhere where you can go and those feelings can be held and processed with a professional holding you both in mind. You may find that you're needing to make some really difficult decisions together in your partnership. So decisions around tests, potentially post-mortems, um, making decisions on when to try again. And maybe you're at a crossroads on your fertility journey and having to make difficult decisions about next steps. So again, making sure that you're communicating about this and getting in additional support so that you can talk about it with professionals who can give you some wise advice and just hold space for these really, really challenging conversations. This will put a big pressure on your relationship, but that doesn't mean that it's insurmountable. We also find that the loss of a baby can have a huge impact on the whole family. 
because of course our family members are also grieving. They may have lost a grandchild or a niece or a nephew and they're having to see their loved ones go through something so painful. So it's likely to be incredibly distressing for them. They're going to be processing their own pain. But what we can find is that this sometimes shines a light on family dynamics that are sometimes a bit less helpful. And these may be things that you're already aware of or actually maybe you haven't been aware of them and suddenly you're faced with the reality that maybe your loved ones are unable to hold your feelings in the way that you need them to. So you might find yourself not expressing your feelings in front of them. Or you might find that you end up looking after them. So you're trying to hold in your emotions to make sure that they're okay or comforting them in their distress when really what you need is to be able to express your pain and be looked after by those around you. So this is a really tricky time. You may be navigating lots of what we call secondary losses. So the loss of relationships that you had pre and post loss. That doesn't mean the end of the relationship, but it may mean the end of them as you knew them, where you become more aware of, of dynamics. Um, and it can bring up lots of difficult feelings of maybe anger or frustration when really you want to be looked after and held in mind by other people. Loss can also take a huge toll on our friendships um, because sometimes our friends maybe, like our family, will struggle to know how best to support us. Sometimes you might find that people disappear because they don't really know how best to support you. Sometimes they might do or say things that are really painful. And often that's not from a place of um, malice. It's just that people really struggle to know what to do and what to say. So they feel that not saying anything is better than saying something wrong, when quite honestly, the opposite is often true. And I'll be talking in a later section about how people can better support you. So you can always direct friends and family to that section to listen to themselves. Sometimes we find that our friends will actually become triggers for our distress. So if they themselves are pregnant or have a baby or have other children, we might find it really hard to be around them because they have what we have just lost. And that's a really painful thing. So lots of people I talk to will feel shame and guilt because they feel that they actually can't see their friends at this moment in time. And again, that's really normal. You're just trying to protect yourself. You're trying to protect your heart. But what that may mean is that you can't get the support that you so desperately need and deserve at this time. I think it's important to be able to assert boundaries and communicate with your friends about this and tell them that you love them, care for them, you still love and care for their children as well, but right now it's actually just too difficult for you to be around them so that they can understand why this might be hard for you and also acknowledging that that's likely to be hard for them as well. But our friendships can really struggle in the aftermath of loss. And if you're finding that, again, you're not alone in those experiences. Sometimes I advise people, or I think, think with people about kind of building around their friendships. So you might want to expand your friendship group to find people who have been in a similar situation to you. So peer support, finding people who really know what you're going through. And sometimes what you might find is if you can build your network enough so that you've got enough people around you who can, who know what to say, who really get it, that sometimes that can help preserve the relationships with the people who maybe can't. And it's not necessarily that they're not able to or they don't want to, it's just that if they've not been through it, it's really hard to truly connect with them because they will never really understand where you're coming from. So building your network, building your friendship group and getting peer support is something that can really help in the long term in preserving relationships. But again, communication is key. It's hard and not everyone is able to manage this. We know that. We know that some people just aren't able to cope and support us in the way that we want them to. Um, but often, if we're able to give people the right guidance, the right information, it can help equip them with the tools to be able to be there for us in the way we want them to be. In this section, I'm going to think about how do you build a support network around you and thinking about that from multiple different sources. 
I mentioned in a previous section about peer support and I think for lots of people that can be one of the biggest things that helps them to, to navigate life after loss. So finding people who really get it, who really understand, who've stood in your shoes and know all the feelings and all the thoughts that you're likely to be having. So seeking out those people can sometimes be hard, um, but there are loads of sources of support out there. So main charities like the Miscarriage Association, Tommy's, the baby charity, um, and SANS, they're three of the bigger ones where I know that they provide support groups online, support forums, and where you're likely to find people who are at a very similar stage to you after loss. So there's multiple different ways to connect, face-to-face, -face, online, just so that you know that you're not alone and what you're thinking and feeling is absolutely normal. And often we don't necessarily believe that until someone else says, yeah, I feel that way too. So peer support is really, really important. Another source of support is social media. So you can search hashtags around miscarriage and baby loss and often find so many different accounts and blogs who talk about their own personal experiences of baby loss. All I would say is that just go with care on social media because even with the most supportive intentions, it can fall into the same pitfalls of comparison and not feeling like we're doing things right or grieving properly. Um, so always use social media with care, particularly when you're feeling vulnerable. You might also want to think about what professionals you want as part of your wider network and support team. So for example, your GP, making sure that they're keeping an eye on your physical recovery and your emotional recovery. You might have contact with a bereavement midwife, for example, or you might be wanting to have more contact with an obstetrician, a gynaecologist, um, or maybe with some more specialist services for treatment and testing. So for example, Tommy's have some specialist clinics through the country where they do more testing around miscarriage and stillbirth. So looking into those and thinking like, is this something you want to add into your support network? Likewise, if you are on a fertility journey, you might be thinking about what further support you want from your clinic, or maybe even thinking about a different clinic that you want to try. So really thinking about the professionals around you, where can you access support, and who do you need? And of course, mental health, you might be thinking about counselling or other psychological therapies. Again, these may be accessed through your GP and the NHS, um, but certainly some charities also provide free counselling after a baby dies. So really look into all of those different options. It's really important to think about yourself holistically as well. So what other things do you want to add in as part of your recovery, as part of your grieving, as part of your need for further support? So that might include maybe some alternative therapies if that's something that you find helpful. Maybe some movement therapies, we know that can really help with trauma. So maybe some trauma-informed yoga, so looking online for places that may be able to offer something around that. And then thinking about your spiritual needs, your religious, your cultural needs, and where can you access support and guidance around those things? I know sometimes that can be really tricky because for some people they don't feel supported by those around them and baby loss, pregnancy loss, can feel very misunderstood. Um, so really thinking about who can you connect with who may be from a similar community from yourself where you can get some more support and guidance. In this next section, I'll think with you about how to manage triggers. Because when a baby dies, we often feel like we're thrown into a world where everyone else is pregnant or everyone else gets to bring home a baby or everyone else falls pregnant with the drop of a hat. So suddenly the world will feel like a very dangerous place and we're just navigating this gauntlet of who's going to trigger me and when. This is a really normal response. So the threat part of your brain is really active right now. So it is making you very hypervigilant to your surroundings. So you might find yourself kind of looking out when you're walking down the street or getting on the train, looking out for pregnant people, looking out for signs of people that you want to avoid. You might find that you're looking at photos on social media, trying to search for signs for people that they're about to announce a pregnancy. You might be trying to avoid seeing people at work or friendships because you're really fearful of those unexpected announcements that tend to be sprung on us. 
again, this is really understandable. The world can feel like a really risky, dangerous place when we've been through something so devastating. What's really important is that you think about how do you keep yourself safe without restricting your life so much that you can't do the things that you need to do. So sometimes we're not going to be able to avoid difficult situations because life is tricky and life is full of triggers. Um, but setting some boundaries around what you will and won't do may help to protect your emotional well-being and just protect your heart. So don't pressurise yourself to go to baby showers um, or to go and meet new babies if that feels really uncomfortable for you. And it might not. Not everyone feels this way after a baby dies. Some people feel comfortable being around other babies because they can separate that out from their own baby that they've lost. But for lots of us, it can feel very devastating, really triggering. And I certainly used to avoid a lot of things because I just found it too overwhelming to be around people who were getting their happy ending when my life had just turned on its head. So being clear, setting boundaries, explaining to friends and family why you're not able to maybe go to things that they want you to go to, explaining why that's really difficult and that one day you hope that you will, you will be able to do those things again, but right now you just can't and that's okay. In this next section, I'm going to talk about trying again for another baby, which is not an easy decision and one that comes with lots of complicated emotions. Some of you may feel that you want to try again straight away, that desperation to hold a baby in your arms, to be pregnant again, to have a baby to nurture and look after is so overwhelming that you are desperate just to get going, try again. For some of you, there may be no choice but to wait because of physical recovery times and test results that you're waiting for. You may be needing to get the all clear before you can safely try again. You may also be in a position where you're thinking about next steps of fertility treatment, which there are financial implications, there are waiting times. So we know that it's not an easy decision and that it's not necessarily a decision that feels like it's in your hands all of the time. Whatever your decision, again, there is no right or wrong. And sometimes you need to take some time to process what's happened. And sometimes actually it doesn't happen automatically. We know that lots of people experience secondary infertility after loss. For lots of people, there are multiple procedures, for example, after a miscarriage, maybe having to have multiple operations to get your body back to where it needs to be in order to conceive again. This can feel like such a cruel blow when you've been through something so difficult and so upsetting. And sometimes it can feel like the world is continuing around you and yours is on pause. You were on this road, on this trajectory to having a baby and suddenly someone stopped that from happening. And you're trying desperately to get back on that road and there are lots of barriers in your way. So I know that this isn't an easy thing. This isn't necessarily straightforward. And as I've mentioned before, there will be lots of people who are at crossroads at this point and thinking about what are their different options and next steps, particularly if you've been on a complicated fertility journey. We know that people who do get pregnant after a loss or after a trauma, that this isn't necessarily a joyful experience. It's the blissful ignorance of pregnancy that you may have had before has completely disappeared. So even if you are hoping to get pregnant and you get that positive pregnancy test, you may feel joy in that moment and then suddenly overwhelming fear. And we also know that for lots of people, they'll have a renewed grief for the baby that they've lost. So there's lots to navigate when you're trying to get pregnant again. And it comes back to this idea of secondary losses, the loss of innocence, the loss of joy, the loss of that kind of blissful bubble that sometimes people find themselves in when they're pregnant. You may feel cheated of that. And again, that's really valid. It's important, again, that you think about what support you need around you at this time, because your support is going to change now. And very often I talk to people who feel like they're caught between two worlds at this point if they fall pregnant again. They don't feel like they belong necessarily or are welcome in the infertility or loss world. And they certainly don't feel like they belong in the fertile world and the world of non-loss. And it's this sort of no man's land in the middle where you feel like 
well, where do I fit and who do I get my support from? So again, thinking about the charities and social media and organisations where you can start to rebalance and shift your support network so that you're getting the right support around you at this time. You may feel that you can't go to the normal pregnancy classes, the yoga classes, the antenatal classes that you wanted to or did before. And again, that's absolutely understandable. It's very hard to be in situations where you feel like you're holding something that you want to talk about, but don't necessarily feel comfortable to. But it's really important that you think about maybe alternative ways in which to get your needs met, to make sure that you're getting the information that you need when you're on this next stage of pregnancy after loss. So again, really thinking holistically about all the things that you might need at this time and going forward. In this next section, I'm going to talk about trying again for another baby, which is not an easy decision and one that comes with lots of complicated emotions. Some of you may feel that you want to try again straight away. That desperation to hold a baby in your arms, to be pregnant again, to have a baby to nurture and look after is so overwhelming that you are desperate just to get going, try again. For some of you, there may be no choice but to wait because of physical recovery times and test results that you're waiting for. You may be needing to get the all clear before you can safely try again. You may also be in a position where you're thinking about next steps of fertility treatment, which there are financial implications, there are waiting times. So we know that it's not an easy decision and that it's not necessarily a decision that feels like it's in your hands all of the time. Whatever your decision, again, there is no right or wrong. And sometimes you need to take some time to process what's happened. And sometimes actually it doesn't happen automatically. We know that lots of people experience secondary infertility after loss. For lots of people, there are multiple procedures, for example, after a miscarriage, maybe having to have multiple operations to get your body back to where it needs to be in order to conceive again. This can feel like such a cruel blow when you've been through something so difficult and so upsetting. And sometimes it can feel like the world is continuing around you and yours is on pause. You were on this road, on this trajectory to having a baby and suddenly someone stopped that from happening. And you're trying desperately to get back on that road and there are lots of barriers in your way. So I know that this isn't an easy thing. This isn't necessarily straightforward. And as I've mentioned before, there will be lots of people who are at crossroads at this point and thinking about what are their different options and next steps, particularly if you've been on a complicated fertility journey. We know that people who do get pregnant after a loss or after a trauma, that this isn't necessarily a joyful experience. It's the blissful ignorance of pregnancy that you may have had before has completely disappeared. So even if you are hoping to get pregnant and you get that positive pregnancy test, you may feel joy in that moment and then suddenly overwhelming fear. And we also know that for lots of people they'll have a renewed grief for the baby that they've lost. So there's lots to navigate when you're trying to get pregnant again. And it comes back to this idea of secondary losses, the loss of innocence, the loss of joy, the loss of that kind of blissful bubble that sometimes people find themselves in when they're pregnant. You may feel cheated of that. And again, that's really valid. It's important again, that you think about what support you need around you at this time, because your support is going to change now. And very often I talk to people who feel like they're caught between two worlds at this point, if they fall pregnant again, they don't feel like they belong necessarily or are welcome in the infertility or loss world. And they certainly don't feel like they belong in the fertile world and the world of non-loss. And it's this sort of no man's land in the middle where you feel like, well, where do I fit and who do I get my support from? So again, thinking about the charities and social media and organisations where you can start to rebalance and shift your support network so that you're getting the right support around you at this time. You may feel that you can't go to the normal pregnancy classes, the yoga classes, the antenatal classes that you wanted to or did before. 
And again, that's absolutely understandable. It's very hard to be in situations where you feel like you're holding something that you want to talk about, but don't necessarily feel comfortable to. But it's really important that you think about maybe alternative ways in which to get your needs met, to make sure that you're getting the information that you need when you're on this next stage of pregnancy after loss. So again, really thinking holistically about all the things that you might need at this time and going forward. This section is for friends and family and for anyone who is interested in thinking about how they can better support someone who has gone through loss at any stage on their path to parenthood. If you are here watching this section, I want to say on behalf of every parent who's been through something difficult and traumatic on their journey to parenthood, a sincere thank you. Because what we want is people to be interested in learning more about loss and trauma and learning how to better support and feel comfortable with having these conversations. So thank you so much for being here. I wish that I could just give you a list of things that you should do and that will make this better, but unfortunately I can't. And often the thing that I tell people is that the biggest thing is about a willingness to get things wrong, to have feedback from people that you're trying to support and to adapt how you're supporting them. Often when you're supporting someone who's been through something really difficult, it's about kind of getting a thick skin and appreciating that they are going to be very different, particularly in the early days after their loss. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to support someone who's in pain and grieving. They may be a different version of themselves than, than you're used to. And that is very difficult. And it's really important that you make sure that you're getting the support you need in order to fill your reserves so that you can better support them. That said, I am going to give some general ideas and pointers of things that you might want to hold in mind when you're supporting someone who's been through loss at any stage and in any form. The first thing is to make contact. Be in contact unless you've been advised otherwise. And often I would say caveat that with um, the permission to not respond. So checking in by text or maybe sending a voice note and saying, you don't need to respond, but I really just want you to know that I'm thinking of you and I'm holding you in mind and I'm here for you. You might phone people, but don't expect them to pick up. You might want to give them a message before you call them, just saying, look, I'm gonna call you in 10 minutes. If you want to pick up, then do, and if you don't, then that's fine. But ultimately, just knowing that someone's thinking about you and holding you in mind can be one of the most powerful things that you can do for someone when they are in some of their darkest times. If the person does want visitors, going round and sitting with them can be a really difficult thing to do, sometimes quite scary, because you don't know what to expect. You don't know what the person is going to be feeling or how they're going to be. But just being able to sit next to someone when they are distressed is sometimes one of the most powerful and supportive things that you can do. You can't fix this. I know that you probably wish that you could, but you can't. But being there and sitting next to someone, holding their hand, sitting in silence with them can really mean the world to someone whose world has fallen apart. Allowing them to have whatever feelings that they have and validating them, again, is a really powerful thing. It sounds simple, but validating someone's feelings is an intervention within itself. Saying, of course you're gonna feel like that. That makes complete sense. It's important that you acknowledge that sometimes those feelings are gonna be difficult, but knowing that you accept them for all that they are in that situation is a really, really supportive thing that you can do. Being curious is another thing that you can do for the bereaved parents. So asking questions, um, tolerating them saying, no, I don't want to answer that. But likewise, they may really want to talk about what's happened. They might want to talk about the baby that they've lost or the hopes that they had for that baby, that child. So being able to ask questions like, did you know the gender? Did you name your baby? Do you have any photos or mementos or keepsakes you would like to share with me? Knowing that someone is interested and wants to know about what we've been through is incredible. It's an amazing thing that you can do for the person that you care about. So be curious. 
Remember that the person that you are caring about may have been through something physically very traumatic as well. They may have had surgery, they may have given birth, they may have had some very invasive interventions if they've been through a fertility treatment journey. So really thinking about what can you do to better support their physical health and well-being. Are there things that you can take round, food, um, other things that, that may help them in their physical recovery? There's something else that you can actually do and feel like you're kind of being useful in some way to that person. Naming the elephant in the room is something else that you can do. So you may have children yourself already, you may be pregnant. So actually these are things that might be very difficult for your friend to be around. And that can leave people feeling quite consumed with shame and guilt. If you're able to own that and say, this might be hard for you, would you prefer me not to come round? Or would you prefer to see me without my children? And this is something that you can do to take the burden off of the person who's suffering. Likewise, being able to tolerate criticism, being able to tolerate rejection is really key too. So your loved one may say, I don't want to see you, or actually it is too hard for me to see you. And that will be hard for you, but it's important that you get your support elsewhere to manage those feelings. Your friend, your family member, they're just trying to survive something that feels at this moment in time maybe unsurvivable. So being able to hold that and get your support elsewhere is key. We know that this is really hard for you as a family member or as a friend. And it's really important that you look for your own source of support. You may be grieving yourself. You may be grieving a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, a godchild. This is going to be really tough for you. You're going to be seeing your friend or family member suffering. That takes a huge emotional toll. So make sure that you are getting the support that you need. There's a really lovely theory around the circles of support. And this idea that the person who is at the, in the middle of that is the one who's experienced the trauma or the loss. And then around them are the close family and friends and so on and so forth to people who are less close to them. And the idea is that you, you support inwards to the circles that are kind of in from you in your circle and you dump outwards. So you would never go into the person who is suffering for support. You always look for support kind of further away. And likewise, they shouldn't be supporting out. They should always just be receiving um, support into them. Okay. So making sure that you look after yourselves will really help you to be there in the way that we need you to be as people who've been through things that are really difficult. I'm Dr. Michelle Tolfrey and I'm a clinical psychologist and my pronouns are she, her. I specialise in working with trauma and loss as a psychologist, but I also have personal experience of baby loss. So I bring two hats to this conversation. And these are my five top tips for coping with life after loss. My first tip is to validate all of the feelings that you experience. There is no right or wrong way to feel in the aftermath of loss. Whatever loss you've experienced in whatever form at whatever stage, your feelings count. They matter, they make sense. So validating them to yourself, accepting validation from others, is one of the core things that you can do. My second tip is to take your time. Grief does not have a time limit. It doesn't have a kind of normal trajectory. It will go all over the place. It can feel messy and chaotic. There is no right or wrong way to move forwards in your life after the loss of a baby. So take your time, go slowly, and know that grief will be with you for the rest of your life. It just changes in its form and intensity. My third tip is to look for multiple sources of support and make sure that you have a good network around you to help you in the early days, weeks, months and years after you experience your loss. So that might mean peer support, so people who've been through something similar. It might mean professional support, either physical health or mental health. And thinking really holistically about yourself as a person, uh, your physical health needs, your spiritual needs, Really think about what do you need around you to help you through this really difficult, painful time. My fourth tip 
is allowing yourself to set boundaries. It's really important to think about what's right for you and how to look after your own mental health, your own heart. Life can be really painful after a baby dies or something happens on your path to parenthood. So setting boundaries, knowing your limits, learning to say no is really key. Sometimes that might be hard because not everyone's good at accepting when we put in boundaries, but that doesn't mean it's the wrong thing to do. We must set boundaries to protect ourselves. So you might find that you need to repeat over and over again, but setting boundaries is important for your emotional well-being and recovery. And my fifth tip is to ask for help. There's the saying that it takes a village to raise a child, but it certainly also takes a village to recover from the loss of one. So if you feel that you are struggling, please don't do this alone and make sure that you do ask for help.